Okay, here we are at Open Days. Open Beer Days. Yes. Open Beer Days. Yep. And you are? I'm a Werner. Um, I work already with Rie Fontaine since 2013. So together with Michael and Armand, we actually uh, uh, wrote a bit the future for Rie Fontaine. And I'm the person that is responsible to uh, keep watch over what we planned, that everything is executed from, let's say, the administrative and the financial part uh, and make sure that all the uh, creative people and the artists on the side of, of the brewing, the blending, uh, can remain a bit creative and that all the rest of the overhead is taken care of. I grew up in uh, St. Vincent Solodo, which is next to Deso. Um So uh, I, I wasn't your uh, average beer drinker, so I also skipped the whole phase of going out and drinking cheap lagers from a plastic cup. Because you were working every week. I was uh, at, working at every parents? weekend. Yes, uh, they had a grocery store. Yeah. Um, so and then uh, I started studying in Brussels. And one day uh, at noon, there was a festival in in the park, uh, and there was free uh, sandwiches with uh, white cheese and a glass of Bellevue Creek or Goose. Um, and I quite enjoyed the uh, combination, not knowing what Bellevue stood for at that time. I came home uh, and my father, uh, when, when uh, telling about it, my father said, like, it's, uh, it's something you shouldn't be drinking any longer. Uh, next Sunday, we will go out and have a decent goose. And that's the first time that I drank a goose, it was a Trifontaine goose uh, at the terrace of uh, the Trifontaine restaurant. And I remember Armand coming over and seeing like a young guy, I was 17 uh, back in those days, uh, seeing a young guy drinking a, a goose. And he was surprised and he comes over to me and he started to, to, to converse, uh, he started a conversation with me, uh, asking like, what do you like about it? Um, do you know about it? So yeah, my very first goose, yeah, goose is an acquired taste, so very first goose was uh, really interesting, I would you say. You had the master explain what you were <laughs> But then of course, with the whole explanation, second and third goose are tasting completely different, and that's how you start to appreciate. And before I knew it, five years later, I made uh, my, uh, or three years later, I started my thesis on uh, traditional goose and, uh, and lambic brewers uh, compared to the more commercial and industrial ones and what their financial pains are, their perspective for the future, knowing that half of the 90s traditional goose was almost extinct. Um, and Armand was actually the only lambic brewer and uh, goose blender that was so open about his business, about his financials, because he also appreciated um, the feedback that I would give him, like, uh, one of his uh, questions was like, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? So, and uh, yeah, that's where I met Armand uh, in, a, in a very uh, good way. Um, the years after I bought even more Three Fontaine to store away my cellar, still have some bottles left. Um, and Armand became a friend. And then in 2013, meanwhile, I also helped him in 2009 to pour out uh, the bottle. So I was quite, acquainted with the story of, uh, of Drie Fontaine as a, as a brewery and as a blender. Um, I also knew uh, Michael, uh, with which I followed uh, the uh, brewing course. So there was already like a, a very nice contact. And then uh, summer, I think August 2013, one day I was going to Basel to fetch my case of Goes and their uh, three tables were lying full of plants and Armand uh, asked me to come over to have a look and he started to explain about the future ambition, getting the four different locations to have them uh, centralized at one place, not a brewery, but especially uh, the barrel room and the warm room and all of the operations, the bottling parts, the labeling parts, to have that on one uh, central location. And I was, I don't know what struck me, but I asked him like, look, do you, do you already have a business plan? So like, what? He said like, what is a business plan? So like, a description of where you want to go to, some calculations, how much is it going to cost you. You need to, to uh, have also a timing, okay, because if you want to blend the Goethe, um, you have to empty your barrels that are stored in location one, location two, location three, that will be difficult. You can only move barrels when they're empty. So we, you will need to come with a whole plan. How are you going to finance that? And that was actually, uh, so he was there, so like, look, he was a bit in panic. He said, like, oh, don't bother me with that yet. 
Uh, so like I answered them like, look, if you'd like to just call me, I, I would like to help. I would like to help Drifuntan so that my children and grandchildren <laughs> can still enjoy Drifuntan. I know what you went through. This is a really beautiful idea. I want to help building it. And uh, October 2013, out of the blue, he called me and said like, Werner, I think it's time uh, we, we have to sit together because things are getting serious. And that is how for the first time, uh, all of us got together and we started to discuss on the future plans of the Fontaine. And for Ayamon, it was a nice moment because the, the weeks after, Michael and myself, we sat together. So Michael from production side, me from a more financial perspective to actually uh, join the operational uh, difficulties and the challenges that would uh, arise with the plan and to have that figured out financially, what it would cost, what the investment would have to be and so on and so on. And that is I just also as a kind of an anecdote, one Sunday, so because we worked on Sundays, because Michael had to work uh, during the week uh, in the brewery, uh, I had to work at, uh, at Proximus. One Sunday we sit together um, working on it and all of a sudden my mom comes in. Um, he never explained us why he had to be there. We think now that he just wanted to come and have a peek on how things were going. And while he was leaving, he just said, like, I'm uh, loving what I'm seeing. And that is for five minutes, and he was gone. And for five minutes, Michael and myself, I still have goosebumps when talking about, we didn't know what to say. And so we, we knew somewhere, like, this is, this is really what Armand has in mind for Dave Fontaine. And yeah, it's a beautiful Probably story good. ever since. Yeah. And how is Armand doing? Armand is doing well. Um, so, as uh, a lot of people know, he's recovering from a uh, from cancer treatment um, and he has to go to uh, yeah, physical recovery. Um, also with the COVID, that process has been uh, put on hold because of the, you know, there's a lot of interaction with, uh, with uh, physiotherapists, um, but he's, he's well, uh, considering the circumstances. Um, if he could, he would be here every day with us. Uh, as Agmo is still our, uh, let's say, our inspiration for what, for what we are doing now. Um, but uh, yeah, all things considered, he's, he's doing fine. What was your strategy for COVID? I've heard that you actually got signs that things were a problem in January and so you were well prepared and adjusted well and it speeded up some of your plans. Uh, well, actually, we're thinking already for a longer period about uh, starting a, uh, a web shop because we, so if we take a look at what is happening in the beer world, there is actually for us a very important customer, which is the consumer, the fan, the Lambic aficionado. Uh, and we were thinking about uh, getting closer to the consumers through a web shop. Uh, when COVID hit us and we went into lockdown, we actually stopped everything because distribution stopped as well. And we, uh, we, we, for two months, we actually twisted to a webshop model, uh, initially for Belgium and Europe. Um, and that's ever since. So since March, we have been uh, building further on that. And uh, now it, it has been a lot that we had that webshop because now the, all the running costs, we can cover it with the sales of the, of the webshop. Yeah. And how is Dre Fontaine doing in general? Uh, yeah, I think like for most breweries, for a lot of breweries, uh, we are, I won't say we're suffering, but it's a challenging time. Um, so we also hope that COVID will go over uh, very soon. Um, the, the truth is also, a, we, as a traditional Lambic brewery, we are blessed, but we are also cursed. We're blessed in that sense that the beer doesn't turn bad. Um, a lot of breweries that make very fresh beer, they had to destroy part of their inventory. Uh, they went uh, in the lockdown, they didn't brew. Now they're brewing again or they're starting up to brew again. Uh, in our case, we had a lot of bottles that don't turn bad. They get better over time. The average uh, age or the average age of the Lambic uh, is, uh, is increasing in our barrels. The average age of the barrel of the bottles in the warm room is also increasing, which is a good thing. But we will be hit with the COVID aftermath only in a couple of months. And we think that there will be a spread over the next two to three years in that sense that we have a bottle inventory that is quite high, uh, with which we can bridge the next two years. So that means that next brewing season and the brewing season afterwards, we will have to brew a lot less than what we actually plan to. 
because there was no distribution over the couple uh, uh, last couple of months, the last six seven months. So yeah, we are we are still figuring out what to do the next brewing season and the brewing season afterwards. We think that the next two years in terms of economic situation will be uh, more challenging for brewers as well as as uh, as bars and restaurants. So. We will have to see, but hopefully everything turns around again in 2021. And I suppose it's all a matter of inventory and cash flow. Well, the thing is, we are we have a very slow process. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have 8,000 hectoliters of uh, Lambic inventory on oak barrels, and we have 3,000 uh, hectoliters of bottled production every year. Um, as COVID slowed down, we still have more than 2,000 hectoliters in our inventory of the warm room. So that means that we only have to uh, uh, add a little proportion to be able to sell for the whole year. But 2021, 2022 will not be a normal year. Uh, and we want to keep uh, the two and a half years throughput period in our uh, barrel room. We want, to rem- we want to keep that on the upside for the consumer. Probably next season we will be able to blend more golden blends than all the goods. Uh, but in terms of cash flow, now it's break even. So everything that comes in immediately it's gone to to pay our staff, uh, to pay uh, the the, uh, uh, the suppliers. So and given all the circumstances that is now, we're not complaining uh, uh, despite the uh, the crisis. Yeah. How about the plans for growth, uh, growing this, uh, you construction plans, you had mm-hmm. beautiful plans. Have you put those on hold? or are you These are now put on hold because of the crisis. So we're assessing the situation with all the parties involved, uh, but we won't be, uh, we won't be uh, advancing anytime uh, soon or in a couple of weeks uh, or months to come. So, yeah. so a lot of Lambic and Gers lovers can cry, but also be happy that you will continue you had a strong years to support this throughout. Mm-hmm. Well, um, aside the expansion that we were planning for, there was another angle that for the long-term strategy of Drifontana, we are uh, continuing despite the crisis, and that's uh, go deeper into tradition and history of, uh, of Lambic. So uh, last two years, uh, so last uh, harvest and uh, the harvest of 2019, uh, we have been working with 15 farmers from the area, from Pajotaland, um, to get our uh, cereals from there. So uh, uh, we're talking about barley and wheat. And that project hasn't stopped uh, because of the crisis, uh, because it's local people with which you can still uh, uh, work together. Um, yeah, the harvest was there, so uh, the, the, the whole uh, seeding program, uh, how do you call it? Yeah, the seeding program started already in October last year. This year, the challenge for them is like, look, as the Fontana next harvest, we will need less cereals. Uh, let's find other brewers, uh, mills, bakers, uh, malteries that are also interested in those local cereals. So that part of the, of the, let's say, execution of our strategy hasn't stopped. It's really the market side where we see uh, the impact of the crisis. But going or uh, going deeper on, on uh, where our fruit comes from, where our cereals come from, that hasn't stopped. And your Scarbexer Creeks program is still ongoing, developing Absolutely. homeowners, yep. and that's so unique yep. to, to you guys. And I guess the local support is so important, mm-hmm. backbone of your culture. Absolutely. And that, that is also part of what our ambition is. So today we have uh, about 75 families. We started four years ago to structurally approach and try to grow the number of families with Scarbex uh, uh, cherry trees in their, in their uh, garden. Um, and um, so we have now 75 families, but at the same time, from a few of those families, we have been uh, uh, collecting uh, the mother material to actually start to uh, uh, spread the number of uh, uh, root spruces or root springs. Yes. Um, so that we can actually, over time, and that's a bit the idea, over 10 years, that we have about 2,000 wild skybakes and cherry trees. So not the grafted ones, not the, the, the high standards, but low standard and even bush alike, skybex and cherries, uh, cherry trees that we can actually uh, spread over more families, people that are interested. For example, yesterday there were a lot of young people that say like, look, we have a piece in our back uh, backyard, in our garden that we want to put a, a skybex and cherry tree, but we're looking for material. We say like this harvest, we will have already hundreds first trees that we have been growing over the last three years that we want to give away 
yes. uh, in return for the people's references, like name, email address, telephone number, so that we can, together with them, we can follow up the growth of the tree. And after so many years, because on average it takes five to seven years, that we can actually buy those sour cherries from them, sour skybex cherries from them. That's a bit the idea, so that the standard creek for Drifontana becomes 100% Skybex. Here you are at Open Day, so do you plan to continue and hope that... Well, we have been um, thinking about it, reflecting about it for a long time. Should we do it to have the Open Beer Days? We have been assessing the situation up to the last minute almost before we, uh, we sold the tickets to see if we could continue it. We are very happy that we can open our gates for for the uh, for the fans and for the uh, uh, aficionados. Uh, of course, we have limited it to 125 uh, people uh, per day, um, which helped us to manage the situation. It's quite spread now, and, and that's that's good because we also have to take care with the with the uh, um, the conditions that the uh, the government has uh, have uh, um, uh, have published. Um, so it's well managed, I think, um, but hopefully next year we can uh, allow a lot more people uh, uh, in our garden uh, because there was a, a lot of interest to come over because yeah, it's one of the only beer festivals of the summertime. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it's great Thanks. to see Drifontaine thriving at least as best as it can. Thank you great very much. To see you.